Hello and welcome to another Dawncast podcast. I'm Di Lee. And today we've got Lee Ho, who I would like to call a friend, uh, coming to join us to talk to us about recycling garbage and her journey into building a successful business. Um, she's now, I believe, retired. Yes, <laughs> she has retired. <laughs> but I think that it's be great to have Lee um, share with us the journey that that she uh, did in setting up her business to what it was, to what it is, and to where she is today. So, welcome. Thanks for having me, Di. It's always good seeing you. I know, I know. Look, um, let's let's get to the heart of the why we're here. Uh, as I explained, uh, we are trying to really encourage individuals to build themselves, mm. as well as to help them build their business and grow mm. their business um, through watching and learning through Dawncast. I know you've had a few businesses. Yes. Um, tell me, how did you start your journey in setting up your first business? Well, Di, my first business goes back several decades ago now. Um, you look too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> I started my first business when I was um, just turning 21 and um at the time, I was um, prior to starting that business. I um, worked in a shoe shop, so I decided to open a bridal shoe shop. And from there, I moved into dresses, um, wedding gowns, and um, within six years, I built um, up to six stores um, in Sydney. Wow, mm. six stores! And and what was it that motivated you to go out there and? You, you know, to do what you did? I think um, coming from um, a refugee background with my parents being um, refugees, I learnt from a very early age that uh, Australia is a country of opportunities. We are so fortunately um, to be in a country that can offer us so much opportunity and I think when you come from a family that um, started with nothing into a country where um, you have to struggle to assimilate and struggle to um, gain employment, um, learn the lifestyle and the language. When you really have nothing to die, you don't have anything left to lose. Mm. I think, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of refugees and mm. migrants' families, when they settle here in Australia, mm without having the language, yes. um, they have to then start up something themselves yes. rather than being employed. Mm. Um, it, it's a struggle, isn't it? I mean, it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, I think for the the Vietnamese refugees that came into Australia in the late 70s, early 80s, um, employment into an Australian company was very difficult without the language. So I think that a lot of refugees started small businesses because it was the only way that they knew how to create employment for themselves and their families. And how difficult was it? I mean, you know, going into and setting up a business, did you have any business knowledge before that? Um, so I didn't have any business knowledge. So when I went to university, I studied health science. Oh. Um, to become... To become first um, a radiographer uh -huh. and then I thought, well, I didn't really enjoy that. I couldn't see myself doing that for the rest of my life. Then I went on to doing orthoptics, which again is health science. And so after two years, I fell into that same, same um, way of thinking. And then I um, moved across to law. Um, right. But was, I think I didn't really find what my burning desire was until I started managing a shoe shop. Mm. Mm. And what did you see in the shoes? <laughs> a lot of shoes. A lot of shoes. You know what? I, I <laughs> Don't they have to say that women love shoes? <laughs> <laughs> I got to say that I, I, I do have a weakness for shoes and bags yeah. and my mum thinks that I've got a psychological disorder <laughs> um, because I can't stop buying them. And I think for that reason, um, I, w I love shoes and I was passionate and... Um, sort of that's where my passion started and I thought I can look at shoes every day seven days a week <laughs> and I suppose um, going into business I had no skills I had no mentor I had no 
one around me that really um, could teach me the ropes. But I'm kind of one of those people that if you don't know, Google it. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I think going back 20 years now, if you don't know, ask someone. Yeah. So that that was my sort of mantra um, in life was if I didn't know. And you know, no matter where you get in life, no matter what you achieve, you're never going to know everything. So surround yourself with people who do know, with people who have knowledge, who can give you and share with you their knowledge when you need. Um, and I, I did a post today saying that mm. surround yourself with the people who can uplift you. Mm. You know, it's mm. um, Epictetus epi, um, quote. Um, but in terms of what were some of, like were you were there any fears in terms of opening up your first um, uh, shoe store? Mm. Um, if you work in a shoe shop, mm. and then you thought, well, I love shoes so much, I want to have my own business. What were some of the things that you d- did? did you just, I mean, how do, how do you get the money? Where do you get the store? How do you find the things? And mm-hmm. as you said, you had no men- mentors, yes. no one to support you. What was that like? I think going into business for the first time, I, and I, I must say that youth is a wonderful thing because you there is no fear. You, you're you invincible. And at sort of 20, 21, you know, that's, I suppose, the start of your journey into life. And... Because of that fearless attitude, I didn't, I couldn't see any negatives, and I didn't see the fear. I think in hindsight now, um, I think I was crazy, but at the time, I thought, you know what? There's all these positives, and I suppose if 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 I can't see any negatives, then you jump into it head first, and that's what I did at the time. I I didn't have a business plan. I didn't know how to do a PL. and um, All I had was myself, confidence, and a handful of suppliers. And so you then launched into your first business. Business, that's right. And mm-hmm. then you said that you grew that into f- five or six I did. Stores. And so after the first two years, I started pivoting that business. And um, I moved into formal dresses and wedding gowns. Because there's a big, obviously, market mm. in terms of weddings in, in, in the community. So did you already had a – you knew that there was an audience there, so therefore you just – Well, no, I learned as I went along, Di, and I pivoted the business as I went along. And I think um, I chose bridal specifically because it was so destinational. Um, you know, I could get cheap rent in a store that was three levels up from the ground level and um, through word of mouth people found me rather than paying exorbitant rent and being on the ground floor, I didn't have a lot of money when I started. And so um, I didn't have a budget. And what I did was I set the shop up and I bought, I think at the time, maybe 12 different styles of shoes and I was done. I didn't have any backup money. I didn't I didn't factor in rent for the next month because oh my God. being a <laughs> wide-eyed 20-year-old, I just assumed that, I would sell shoes immediately. People would walk in the door. And so there was a lot of learning um, with it. It was, it was quite a process. So did that, if that, so didn't, I mean, like back in those days, not like today mm. where you have the social media where you can promote mm. and camp and market your mm. products. How do you, how, if you had no plan for your rent for the n- mm. next six months um, and how did th- you then pull in customers, um, all of that? If you've got six doors. (laughs) Well, I started with one. I started with one. And um, I just went around to all the bridal dress shops and I dropped all my business cards in. So when they went to purchase their bridal dresses or formal dresses and they were looking for matching shoes, um, the shops would recommend them to me. And that's how I sort of grew. So basically, uh, you know, back in those days, not like today, you don't have the social media, the marketing so how difficult was it for you to run your business um, on your own with no budget, proper budget and planning in place? Well, I, I was on my own because I was there seven days a week. Um, and I think I started by just walking around, dropping my bags and introducing my, myself and my business to um, bridal gown shops and formal wear shops so that when the customer purchased their outfits they could come to me afterwards um to buy the matching shoes and so it you know I didn't know 
what it was called then, but now it's called sort of networking within your um, business, yeah. better been networking. Mm. And how long did it take you from that point to then um, start building your second shop, your third shop, etc.? So within you, you, by that stage, you must have had a business plan in place. I've got to be honest, I. <laughs> I don't think it was maybe a decade later that I really learnt what a business plan was. Wow. Um, I, I think for me, and I've, I have been very, very fortunate, for me, I've, I've learnt as I've gone along. Um, I've pivoted the business as I've gone along and I've had to pivot myself to adapt. Um, you're not always going to be in the same industry for as long as you think you will be. Um, you know, there's going to be other factors, there's going to be um, social factors, there's going to be things like the boom of internet shopping, there's going to be um, things that the government brings out, there's going to be um, all sorts of things and in particular things like what we've gone through recently, COVID, you, you can't prepare for something like that. So basically businesses that are watching us mm. you know like we are told you need to have a business plan in place you need to do this like this uh, uh, there's more structure structures being in encouraged for small businesses for them to able to be able to scale and grow in this day and age yeah and i think it's it's such a great idea i think um you know emerging entrepreneurs these days have so many much more tools at their fingertips and there there are successful people who you know have done the hard yards and are prepared to turn around and spend time to guide and mentor um, emerging entrepreneurs and I think it's a wonderful thing um, back in my days I didn't know what the word was um, and in hindsight I think if I had had those tools if I had better prepared myself um, I think I could have achieved more, um, but w what I had back in those days were very limited and um, so a lot of my journey was to wake up one morning and decide this is what I'm going to do and I set out to do it. Um, there wasn't, there wasn't, I didn't have a contingency plan, I just, um, I made sure that if, if I was passionate, if I believed in it and um, if I could see the benefit, I just went ahead and did it. <laughs> I mean, you, I would say listening to you, I wonder whether or not you were um, also pioneering some of the entrepreneurial, um, you know, like j just pivoting as we're talking mm. about now, you know, because you went, you, you, you did this on your own. Were you, were there times... So this is even before you actually launched into into a, an area that you really had no experience in, no which, idea. which which is waste. <laughs> well, besides kind of chucking <laughs> boxes, probably <laughs> from your shoe boxes, but you went from selling shoes to going into the waste industry. Mm. Um, so tell me, how did you pivot from that? That that's a completely that is and. I think from my journey um, since I was sort of 20 going on 21, um, you, you, you kind of have a gut feeling about something, you're passionate about something and I think it all starts there. Um, I've always gone through life where if an opportunity um, presents itself, I would always look into it. I'd never say no, I would find a way. Um, going from shoes to for warm bridal gowns is very, very different. Um, and then going from bri bridal gowns into waste management, again, was very, very different. And I think I've... <laughs> huge, <laughs> huge. <laughs> you know, you can see from shoes to bridal gown, yes, it's different, but it's kind of still in that um, space of wear and clothing. But from yes, that... it's still very glamorous. Yes. And then you go into waste but management, yeah, which is... Anything sort of but glamorous. Correct. And... Um, I think, again, it goes back to the fact that I didn't... I went through life and I went through business without any sort of planning. I just... It was always a belief in myself that um, 
if I put in 110%, if I did everything I could, if I learnt everything about the business and roll up my sleeves and was prepared to do the hard yards, then um, it would come to fruition. And I think, again, I say um, youth is a wonderful thing because um, it's that fearlessness that you have. Um, and I carried that right until sort of my 30s, my mid 30s that I didn't turn around and and sort of look and say okay I need to plan now. Um, I went through the first 10 years of my entrepreneurial life um, without a plan without really even looking back die and just saying, going forward wow this is what I've done this is where I've come from this is the knowledge I've gained you wake up every day and you keep going and you wake up every day and you find purpose that you can't fail. You have to succeed. And when when I look at that success, I didn't know what that looked like. To me, it was one day I get to lie on a beach somewhere and not have to roll up my sleeves, not have to get in a truck on a 40-degree day without air conditioning, not have to climb into the bin. For me, it was that end journey and along the way I wasn't sure how I was going to get there I didn't have a navigator to say I'm going to punch in this address and I'm going to get there it was for me it was I'm going to navigate and on the way if I didn't know or if I got lost I'd pull over and ask someone Mm -hmm. so my mindset I think um, and how I've achieved what I have has I think, gone back into the conditioning of my upbringing. And it was the fight of, you know, my parents' journey, um, not knowing what to expect and not knowing what the outcome will be, but fighting every day to get to the best part of your life and to get to the best person that you can be. And I think part of that came back to my conditioning and upbringing. Do you think it's because of us, uh, being refugees, it's that struggle for survival. It's about making sure that you get to that land of opportunities and then just continually work work without, as you said, stopping back to reflect, oh, hang on, we've actually landed now here in a safe place and actually yeah. it's time to take a step and, and reflect and see, okay, where the future, how, how are we going to plan out the future? But just as a, oh, we just seem... We've got to work. Like We've got to work, work all the time. And yeah. I think that... that um, that mindset of sort of what our parents went through and what they've done and and in their life and in their retirement has a lot of effect, I think, on the next generation. And I think we're finding now that we have, um, you know, a lot more entrepreneurs in um, the migrant space um, who are okay with not having to be university educated, are okay to say, you know what, I haven't got a degree, but I've succeeded. Um, I think 20 years ago, getting an education was the be-all and end-all. Yep. Um, and, and I think our parents came to this country to expect that the only thing that they could provide for their children was an education of what they lacked. But I think now we have this great opportunity where those who want to get higher education have that opportunity and they can keep going, keep being educated in in their field of passion. And those who don't want to, like myself, um, we don't waste time. Four to six years at university, not finding direction, not finding what we want to do to then fall into something. And I think I you know, throughout my journey, throughout my life, I've fallen into things. Yes, and I've Sammy, I know. certainly been able to um, take, take hold of it and, yes. and make the most of it. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm, I can just relate to that. I, when people ask me, so how did you get into journalism? I said, I fell mm. into it. Yeah. How did I get into politics? I fell into mm. it because, you know, our parents, because as you said, their main, um, when you first get arrived here, the first thing, was they expected you to do was do well at school mm. and get an education mm-hmm. and become either a doctor, a lawyer, a pharmacist, yes. an accountant, <laughs> right? Those are the expectations of you right. know, uh, uh, children of refugees or migrant uh, families. Mm. And so you didn't know any better, mm. right? So you, you fell in and then you kind of 
and you think, for me, I was lucky I fell in into journalism and I loved yes. storytelling. Mm. I loved it. and But I didn't know how to build on it. Do you know mm. what I mean? Mm. Um, and I just kind of just went through it without having anyone to turn to to help me to navigate guide, to guide to, to navigate um you don't know you don't know how to get from a to b you know you jump in your car and you know that you're going from cabramatta to bankstown yeah but if you don't know then you're kind of driving and you're driving in circles because you don't understand and you don't know what the destination is mm. um so going back to your uh, pivoting from your bridal business to mm-hmm. waste um you said you must have seen an opportunity and so you seized that opportunity. Mm-hmm. But once you got into that space, what was that like for you? For a woman of Asian heritage, uh, I don't yeah. think there are many women in no. the waste industry. I think you'd be <laughs> the only one. I think I am. And, I, I you know, again, it's um, it's about falling into something and, and taking that opportunity and seeing what other people don't see. Um, you know, I fell into it and I worked for nearly a year without pay. You know, if you go and ask anyone these days, there's very, very few people that will go to work and not expect um, a, a cent in return. And I've, I've always looked at it like, um, you know, workplace training. Absolutely. And I learnt so much in that year, Di. I learnt from um, operations to logistics to... Um, P&Ls to forecasting, um, anything you can learn in a medium-sized business, I ended up learning, small to medium, I ended up learning. And that was the first time I started to look at numbers and understand how much numbers can tell you about a business. Um, and I've, I've got to say that sometimes in life, it doesn't have to be structured um, you don't have to plan. And when things don't go to plan, it's all right. It doesn't go to plan for a reason. When the opportunity that you try to seek and chase does not present itself, there's always a reason and other opportunities will come up. And for me, um, you know, I was coming to the end of my retail career. I was, um, I think at the time going through a midlife crisis (laughs) (laughs) because the internet had changed um, bricks and mortar shopping so much and I could see the way it was going and I could see um, I couldn't scale anymore as much as I wanted to. Um, And so when this opportunity of waste management came on, I did what I can to learn what I could um, and when the opportunity came up to take over the business wholly, um, I did just that. Um, I think, again, in hindsight, if I had my time again, it was probably one of the most crazy things I could ever have done in my life because it was so different and it wasn't accepted. Um, I, was, I was in my late 20s. Um, I had a newborn son who was only six months old um, and I jumped into this business head first um, without knowing enough about it um, but I quickly learnt and um, it was very difficult um, it wasn't something it, it, it's not a career path that's accepted within you know the Asian community because rubbish is traditionally such a dirty thing mm. um, it's what you do when you've got no other hope in life but I think, um, you know, when we think about waste management today, 40% of those employed in waste management do come from white-collar backgrounds, are university educated. Wow, that's a large mm. uh, a large percentage. Yes. So it's not something to be little in terms of, you know, in no. the, the career, the, the, the opportunities to... I mean, because... Uh, and I think we've had this discussion before. Waste is such a pivotal part of our... Daily. Absolutely. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do, you're going to generate waste. Yes. And it doesn't matter what the economy is um, or is going into, you know that waste is, um, it's it's never shrinking. With with a growing population in the world, waste can only grow. That's right. Um, So... Just to digress, I mean, this is going to be waste, isn't it? I mean, mm. this 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 will be recycled waste. You can recycle this. Yes, is that right? Yes, that's right. I think I think um, 
over 90% of what we throw out that's currently being buried in a hole can yeah. be recycled if I think the general public understand what can and can't be recycled. And I think, um, you know, recycling and waste management has got to start with a waste generator. That's us. Mm. That's, that's you, right. That's, that's you, and, you and me, um, everybody watching this. I, I brought in a few items because I, yes. want, I wanted um, Lee to explain to us what can be and can't be recycled. Mm -hmm. Um, and only a few things here. I'm sure there are more out there, but I've only brought in a few things, okay. right? Um, okay. So I don't know if people can see this. So it says here there is a, uh, a recycling, a circular. Yep. So there's a little circular. Um, it's an arrow. It's yep. kind of like a diamond. Um, it's a diamond shape with arrows going around it which means that um, in this particular instance, the, it's telling you that the bottle can be recycled and the cap can be recycled. Right. And the cap is in this cap here? Yes, that's correct. So yeah. this cap and the little ring on the bottom. Can be recycled? Yes. Okay. On this particular bottle. On this, okay. And, and this one? And you've got... The same? So you've got this one that only has... Um, sort of the arrows in um, a triangle and it doesn't tell you any more information. So quite often um, these sorts of plastics come from China and so what happens is um, a lot of people may or may not heard of um, China knocking back a lot of our recycling now. And the so sword, not China sword policy in 2018. That's right. So um, it was implemented last year. Um, I think in March last year. And so what they're doing is they're only accepting things that I believe are 97% um, recyclable. So you, you'll have a bottle like this and this is recyclable, but the cap's not. So what happens is generally um, if people know what they're doing, they would throw this in general waste and this is assumed to be recyclable. But... I suppose what people don't realise is there's a ring on the cap. So what happens is this will be, be thrown into a recycling bin and um, this will get knocked back if it gets shipped over to China for recycling because this ring is um, over China's classification of what can be recycled. But that's the bottle that you said is plastic from China. That's right. So, so they, they, we, they, we've got it here, but we can't send it back. That's right, because um, unless you take this ring off, and you can see how difficult die to take this ring off, it's not yeah. easy. Yeah. And so most waste generators are not aware that this ring makes this bottle no more recyclable because um, it tips it over the threshold of contamination. So, okay. Now, what about this one? So this one has got, has it got any, yeah, so it's circular. So this one would be, basically everything would be so recycled. So yeah, so this one now um, tells us that the cap can be recycled yep. and the bottle can be recycled. I don't know if we um, all pay attention to our milk in coals and woolies. So if everyone remembers, previously our, um, our one and two litre milk bottles used to come with something like this with a ring on it and a bottle cap. Um, but now if you go to Coles, you'll find that there's no more ring on it. So you um, you open the milk up and there's this um, foil thing to peel off um, the cap. Yeah. Mm. But the what, the milk bottles, the milk, which haven't got any here, but the milk bottles... Um, Without the ring, is are now recyclable. recyclable. But with yes. the rings? Then they're not, because they're not. it tips over the threshold of right. what we can send over... Um, overseas right. um, that they classify as um, contamination. And for something like this, so this is all... So for something like this, um, th this is glass, yep. so this can be recycled. Everything. Um, with Inclu glass. In including the aluminium? Um, so the al aluminium will get separated um, right. at the recycling facility, and so the aluminium will go into aluminium recycling and the glass will go into glass recycling. Yep. Um, bearing in mind that they're not every glass is recyclable. So you've got, you know, you've got your green bottles, you've got your dark brown bottles, you've got your white bottles, and again, that gets separated into the different streams. 
Um, sometimes glass um, products with a plastic film on it is not recyclable because of that plastic film. And a plastic container like this, so which we obviously a lot at the time when we go to eat, takeaways, mm -hmm. uh, leftover food, we ask our takeaways to take home, mm -hmm. or when we buy and we take home. Yes. So this and the plastic like this, can it be recycled? So plastic like this um, can be recycled, but then you've got instances where, you know, I don't know if um, we're all familiar with this habit where you don't finish your food and then you've got, you know, your plastics in it. Um, you've got your, your bag that this comes into and we all screw it up and we put it in and then we close the lid and we throw it into recycling. Well, it doesn't go into recycling. Mm -hmm. It ends up getting... it contaminates the rest of that recycling bin and it all goes into general waste. So your recycling bin, which is your yellow lid bin, uh, those in New South Wales, I don't know about other states, mm. but in New South Wales uh, with the yellow bin, to put something like this, you contaminate. So you, so no, would would you? Uh, so it's it's got to be clean dough. Yeah. So so, so it can't have food like that even. So this is fine. This, oh, is, this fine. is fine. Yeah. It's only when you've got like when you've not finished a third of your meal. Okay. And, and then there's food in it which um, should go into organics. Yep. Um, when there's food in it, it becomes, um, it doesn't, it, it, it's no longer recyclable um, and it becomes a pretrustable waste, right. which goes into landfill. Okay. So um, anyway, so that's just a little short. I mean, obviously there's more that we need to educate people around waste. Absolutely. And I think... Um, a lot of people believe that, you know, when they're, when they're throwing away different things in the correct bins, um, they've done their part in recycling. But I think there's a lot more to recycling. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of education that needs to go into um, the waste generator to fully understand um, what plastics can be recycled, what plastics are biodegradable, um, and what is considered contamination of a load. Like if you throw one thing in technically you've contaminated your bin and plus everyone else's bin um that that the council have picked up on that stream mm. so i just want to basically would something like this you can recycle but yes. if it's there's some food in there there's spoons and stuff in the wrap all that goes That's in there, right. contaminated. It's contaminated. So you haven't got someone that physically die opens up this lid yep. for you yep and starts taking away and sorting Yep. everything so once it's once it's contaminated it contaminates the load so your knowledge there it's amazing <laughs> so so i know that you you know going back to what you talk about like within our community yes being in the waste industry is not something that people look up to but mm. there's you're making such huge social impact with did you, I mean, did you even knew, know about that when you actually got into waste, that the social impact that you were having? I think that um, when I got into waste management, Di, it was, I, I saw it as a business. Um, I saw it as another business opportunity that could help me eventually get to um, my financial freedom and the freedom of time. Um, but as I went along this journey, I was um, very fascinated with what I learned in waste management. And I think that um, from my experiences and the hardship that I've endured um, on my journey in, in waste management, I started to become very passionate about um, encouraging others to understand waste management more, to understand waste um, more and recycling in Australia more. And um, I think when you do something for a purpose, you you quickly lose passion in it once you get to a certain stage. For me, um, waste management became a passion for me. So it was no longer about just running the business and being profitable, paying staff. It was more about sharing and sending a message. Um, and waste management is not dirty. It's not always um, unhygienic. It it's just male dominated. <laughs> it's very <laughs> male dominated. Um, but for me, it became um, part of my life. So I can't stop walking past the bin without lifting it up and seeing how well um, a shop owner um, separates, separates and recycles. And it's become a, a habit and a passion of mine. And so um, in retirement now, Di, I still talk about waste. I'm still fascinated with trucks. Um, it's still a passion of mine, and I hope to share my knowledge um, as much as I can. 
And what is your advice in terms of for businesses or for individuals? Uh, we, we had a, a chat about this mm. recently around for restaurant because the majority of our migrant uh, f- families and refugees who, who run businesses are yes. mainly in the food uh, yes. sector. Yes. What are some of the advice that you can give? I think for me personally, I'm working with um, so many businesses with owners from non-English speaking backgrounds. I've learned that um, these people are so passionate about coming into Australia and the opportunities that Australia's provided them, and yet they will do anything and everything possible to um, help the environment, to help the country. And I think that People try to do the right thing. I think that um, our system is um, not well equipped enough to um, educate the waste generator and small businesses um, in what can and can't be recycled and also just the monetary cost of recycling. Um, Recycling in Sydney is still very expensive. Um, You know, recycling... Can you explain a bit about that? So recycling for small businesses in particular, if they wanted to recycle effectively, um, they really should have a general waste bin, um, a glass bin, a a plastic and um, paper paper bin, and also an organics bin. Because as you said, Di, there's a lot of food operators. And when food gets mixed in, and, and when I say food, it's the organic waste stream. When it gets mixed in with any of the other waste streams, it contaminates it. And so what is essentially a commodity, which is our paper, plastic and glass, becomes um, it becomes a liability because it ends up going into a hole in the ground. And I think if, if you know, um, waste companies and our government could make recycling a lot cheaper... Um, then I think absolutely we've got buy-in from from so many small businesses. Um, well, I'd like to wrap up from listening to you. I mean, we can go on about this. <laughs> we I, can, I, you know, days. we can go for days. Yes. Uh, but I'd love to obviously wrap up in terms of what I've heard today mm. from you in terms of people starting out. Yes. Uh, so you know, you're you're saying, look, um, go go go. Go for the opportunities, even if you don't, even if you even don't if know, even don't if it's not planned. Yeah. So if an opportunity presents itself, um, you know, it doesn't always have to go with the plan, and it's okay to to divert from that plan, as long as you've um, mitigated potential losses, you've mitigated what can go wrong, and if the benefits outweigh, you know, the negatives, then um, you know, there's, there isn't any reason for you to not go for it. And I think opportunities are not always clear because if they're clear and they're guaranteed, then um, they won't present themselves to you. They'd already been taken up. So I think at the end of the day, you know, sometimes you can go against your plans and it's okay. And if you can seize the day and if you can seize the opportunity and make it work for you, Find your passion in it. Um, it won't always be, um, you know, happy days. There will be a lot of tears. There will be a lot of um, hurdles along the way. And on your way there, there will be a lot of energy vampires that will um, be very negative. But I think you've got to find your feet, find your purpose, reignite your purpose often and... Um, so, so it doesn't have so it doesn't have to be always the one purpose, is it? it you can no, it, it can because people can pivot their business, but people can also pivot themselves. You're not going to be where you are today in ten years' time, and you are not the person you were ten years ago. So, um, you know, your your motivation changes as you get older, as you go through more of life, and um, the sacrifices that we make change. And what we want in our lives will continually change. So people have to be also be prepared to pivot as well. Yeah, pivot themselves, pivot their business, um, but adapt to change. Adapt to change within yourself in order to adapt to change within your business and its environment. Well, thank you so much, Lee. <laughs> That's some great words of wisdom, th- wisdom there for uh, business owners out there struggling 
wanting to know, you know, what should I do now, especially with the current uh, environment, climate, yes. in, in environment mm. with COVID, how to pivot, and if you pivot, how are you going to survive? Mm. Um, and here's this amazing woman. We've survived Thank quite a few pivots <laughs> <laughs> and lived to tell the tale. She's now retired. Um, and, you know, we really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, it's always great to be here with you and the Dawn audience. Thank you. And uh, that's it from uh, me, Diary at Dawncast. If you love what you've heard and you'd like to hear more of these kind of stories, make sure you click on the bell button below and subscribe to us and help us grow. Uh, and uh, yeah, see you next time here on Dawncast. Bye. Bye. You better turn up. You better be there when I shake. Watch me rocking if I